I'm back for a third installment of Pinball FX3 Table Reviews. Let's not waste any time. Jurassic Park starts off with a fake skill shot. Instead of landing in the bird's nest, shoot halfway up the right orbit and have the ball roll back down before making it in the sinkhole. This allows you to skip any mission you choose, which can cut your work in half. My favorite events are the multi-ball stampede and triceratops video mode, where you have to identify three hallucinogenic plants and choose whether to pass them up or munch them down. At first I thought my table was tripping out until I realized there's a manually operated magnet save that uses the launch buttons, and it works down the middle as well. My game really did freak out when a flipper dislocated from its hinge. Maybe it was caused by the vibrator during the T-Rex chase, where you can nudge the table without it tilting. Jurassic World starts off by asking you whether you want to play the table in movie order or select a scene, and the correct answer is scene select because no one wants to keep replaying the same mission each time when it's easier to practice and familiarize yourself at your own leisure. I recommend practicing the three-phase skill shot. It's worth a nice bonus, adds footprint lights to the lanes, and acclimates you to the most important shot on the table, the mission sinkhole, which you'll need to hit three times to begin each scene. Many of them include feeding and hitting dinosaurs, and you'll have to practice catching a ball in different ways, and start making deliberate shots. Scene 6 is a cop-out and forces you to repeat Scene 1 except without screwing up the feeding order displayed on the dot matrix. Multi-ball is spread thin, which is a bit of a shame. Jurassic Park Pinball Mayhem is the name they came up with for the biggest table in this 3-pack bundle. You'll spend time extinguishing fires, banging around a dinosaur testicle, and sniffing the ass of a stegosaurus. There's a couple lanes that are pretty narrow, so you'll need to get used to this before becoming consistent. But it's never frustrating. The weather cycle washes out the playfield, which is really vibrant and colorful during the daytime. And the action can come to a grinding halt once your multiball is ended. There's a bunch of missions and side quests, and an overarching campaign where you want to evacuate 75% of the people from four areas to increase your score, each with their own objective. You can choose where you want to start at the beginning and move to new locations in your Scooby-Doo van. The first Star Wars title I recommend playing is Episode 4, A New Hope. This table shows you how extra playfields should be handled, with simultaneous action both inside and out, where you'll split your focus on the mini playfield and main game. You'll encounter them on scenes 4 and 6, where you'll fight TIE fighters and come across Princess Leia in a jail cell getting busy with herself. Missions are activated by completing rebel rollovers and nailing the left orbit, which is a nice change of gameplay. For a quick score on timed events, I usually start with scene 3 and exploit the multiplier power-up. The ramps can be opened and closed by hitting the land speeder or standalone right-hand target, which connects the playfield to the bumpers. There's other cool modes like avoiding the Tuscan and a shooting gallery. New Hope is filled with flow tree and don't forget you can select your skill shot before launching the ball. Han Solo is a kinky table that sees Solo and Chewie shackling up C-3PO with your favorite Star Wars characters laughing at his expense. There are 10 missions that can be completed in any order, and are activated by making shots, like the probe ramp, death star targets, saucers, etc. Magnus saves can be turned on by hitting the four yellow rectangles. They can be stacked up to three times, and can save balls from going down the outlanes or the middle. Remember to hold the launch button so it doesn't flake out. Speaking of flaky, the XY movement of the crane minigame is a little busted, and the asteroid video mode can end rather quickly if you're trying to fast forward through the cutscene. I like focusing on the bumpers which are hiding in the left pocket and worth big points. Get Chewie to help raise the third bumper so C-3PO can make a break for it. Droids features everyone's favorite robot duo and nice easy noob shots. Missions are accessed from a sinkhole behind the three center drop targets. Scene 1 involves retrieving the parts from C-3PO's decapitated body. After being reassembled, he returns the favor by blocking your view. Mission 2 has you charge up bumper shots before making a ramp. The rest of the events are pretty similar and mostly involve hitting designated shots, and extra balls come naturally along the way with plenty of multi-ball. I like how the missions retain your progress so you don't need to start over if you fail. The most memorable moments come from when R2-D2 sticks his part in a hole and sets up a refreshingly clever puzzle. You switch three rings with the launch button and rotate them with the flippers, collecting five green dots while avoiding three red lights and respecting gravity. Masters of the Force is a simple table compared to the rest of the Star Wars series. The main goal is to start fights by lighting up the center lane and battling drop targets. Whichever flipper you had a blast triggers whether you battle as the light side or the dark, so you can cheat by holding up the opposite flipper if necessary. Completing three fights from one faction unlocks a wizard mode, 
Completing six fights from both unlocks the true wizard mode. You can lower the holocron by hitting the captive ball which opens up some aerial gameplay, which are the funnest shots in the game. I wish this giant snow dome in the middle was more interactive. Instead we get some janky mini field. There's also a semen dish in the bottom left corner that can be accessed by rolling off the top left flipper for an alchemist bonus. Pretty stylish. The Empire Strikes Back has some unique characteristics that get in the way of each other, and others that are just broken. Opening up the scene slot is easy, just go for the Star Wars panels, but if you spell Vader it opens up a frenzy that falls flat. You hit the ball up a ramp and Vader freezes it. These stoppages don't feel natural and get in the way of discovering the table. But maybe it's supposed to be a punishment. You can open up the internal orbits to spell Jedi Training. This and the Darth Vader battle feel like they're on a delay. I get my saber up in time and visually I block it, but it doesn't count. Heads up, scene 2 where you fight the stormtrooper, don't go for the lights, they're lying to you. Hit up the rightmost side and let the ball roll back to the kicker and strike the stormtrooper. The multi-ball times don't come enough, and when they do, I'm already too pissed off anyway. The Empire Strikes Back is overrated. Clone Wars is a table that keeps things moving. Missions are activated by making either ramp to light up letters in council. Objectives include hitting people, lit paths, the usual. But the Iron Curtain mode is probably the most memorable. I like how there's many different ways to get around the table. Keeps the combo game interesting. There's also an extra training mission that's enabled by the outer orbits and found in the gun ramp. There's two extra play fields that have a vertical feel, but aren't too tough if you're used to cradling. Sometimes a ship comes down that won't let me stick a ball in their hole, but I can't completely blame the crew for that. All in all, a solid table. Boba Fett didn't get invited to a lot of parties when he was a kid, and his pinball game has to show for it. Start off by making the skill shot with just enough power for the roll targets. It's kind of important because you can earn valuable ball save timers or extra missiles. This can cause rage resetting. I recommend the 50 million bounty and missiles on the last shots if you need to. Be careful because you can accidentally launch missiles when you're trying to skip downtime. The ball can get caught up in the bumpers for a while and getting to the other side can take pretty long. P.S. I don't understand why my balls don't fit into these spaceships. Return of the Jedi is an underrated table with lots of action beneath the surface. Multi-chapter missions are activated by hitting the front sinkhole four times. Scene 3 has you launching balls from a Tidarium followed by an impressive video mode where you shoot down bikers and dodge trees at ultra high speeds. Mission 4 assaults you with multi-ball, then does it a second time with the lights off. Scene 5 has you challenge Darth Vader by ruining his record player and hitting flashing lanes to escape. Cradling the ball is easy, and if you want to switch flippers, just aim for the orbit and have the ball come around and dead flip to the opposite side. Java the Hutt has some goodies, but R2-D2 is less than reliable when it comes to ball saves. Just bash the flippers and launch buttons and hope for the best. Darth Vader is set up where you shoot back and forth across the playfield in an endless stream of combos. The problem is that they're way too reliable, and make the main mission seem extraneous, which can be started by hitting the base several times. The side goals are the real driving force of this table, and are activated by lighting up ramps. There's enough multi-ball to kill a man, but the main missions aren't as exciting as the hurry-ups. They force you to refocus on making careful shots, and some of them are pretty tricky like mission 2 where your balls freeze in place. At first I thought this was a bug, but you're really supposed to hit the three balls like this without knocking them over. The TIE Fighter trench run looks blocky but controls alright. The cutscenes in the back look like something out of a diorama, Darth Vader more like Dorkinator. Starfighter Assault lets you attack the table from either side, so whichever faction you choose determines which plunger you launch with. Missions can be activated on the top of the playfield by performing a double cross shot into the sinkhole. There's a magnet waiting to catch you that can be reached by the right orbit. Four of the five missions are split into two phases that act as checkpoints so you can pick up where you left off, in case you run out of time or something. There's plenty of video modes, all of which control pretty well, especially the lone fighter pilot which is just begging for a VR mode. Fulfill squad missions, upgrades, bonus events, and have yourself a full on Star Wars pinball experience. Don't forget to claim your promotions if you want to see more multiball. Starfighter Assault is a top ranking table that warrants further investigation. Son of Zeus is a Zen original that's part of the Carnival of Legends 2 pack that centers on old school mechanics and themes. Hold down the left flipper during ball launch so you can open up the orbits for a massive skill shot. There's also a hidden skill shot by soft launching, 
but the best bang is through the middle of the spinning sword. There's a lot of battles that will continue playing out even if you lose a ball. You also don't need to win to collect the Letter of Hercules, but the more missions you complete, the more balls you get during God Mode. The multi-ball inside and outside are very zen-like. The table fights back with memorable monsters and an evil merry-go-round. Son of Zeus is a great table, but it says Hercules on the playfield. Was this to prevent an IP conflict with the real Hercules table? Start a dialogue in the comments. Adventureland is a stunning table that stands out visually amongst the rest. The loop in the back is a fun mini-game that determines how long your fireballs go for big points. And there's also something happening in the backboard that feels like an old mechanical game. I wish the double loops felt as realistic as the rest of the table. It just seems like they should fail sometimes. Only in digital pinball could you complain about something not screwing you over enough. There's busy hands that are activated on the inlanes that swap your balls around and it's pretty wild. Don't forget the skill shot in the right parking garage, which leads to a super skill shot and extra ball. Adventureland is a super sweet table, so make sure you watch your blood sugar and drink plenty of water. Diabetes. Guardians of the Galaxy lets you choose whether you want to start the game in a multi-ball frenzy, or skip the prologue and jump straight into the main game. Missions are activated by simply lighting up the letters on the ramps or hitting targets. The shots aren't tough, but some of the events can be pretty enduring. You don't need to beat each of the six guardians to see the wizard mode, so it's one of those tables that rewards failure. The balls change appearance based on who you summon, which can be a bit of a distraction, or challenge. The characters can sound pretty cringy at times, but most of it's drowned out by guitar loops. And I really don't appreciate this guy blocking my view. I wish he would sit back down in his floor polisher. Ant-Man is a table with high hopes and tiny issues. It has a nice flow that makes it easy to perform impressive shots, enhanced by some cool sound effects and visuals. There's a variety of modes where you can shoot paintballs at moving targets, or zap your balls so you get shrinkage. Microballs are pretty neat, and I wouldn't mind seeing this feature used in other tables to a greater effect. The mini playfield inside the table is hard to see behind the blue glass, and the recovery challenge in the left outline is a total cock tease. You can cheat the system and get a really high score in timed events by doing absolutely nothing. Just let your ball automatically launch and build up points on the bumpers. If you discover any other tables with this kind of feature, drop a line in the comments. Avengers Age of Ultron allows you to choose one of three difficulties. Pick easy if you're trying to complete all the features, and choose hard if you're going for a high score, which makes missions more stringent and increases the pitch of the table. You can also choose to play two ball prelude or skip it if you're happy with your starting total. There are a ton of modes to complete, including seven main missions and six assemble modes, which can be started by collecting letters around the middle loop. Completing goals even helps out your game by increasing mission timers and ball save durations. The missions are started by hitting the ramps, bumpers, spinners, or sinkhole and spelling out the names of different characters. There's a lot of work to do in Ultron, so expect to take a few ages before you can call yourself a master. Marvel's Women of Power Champions has you playing Kamala Khan, whose superpowers include fisting and reach-arounds. The inner orbits are easy to get inside, but the cross ramps can be hard to get up. Kickbacks are easily turned on by banging the fist targets. They even stack and carry over, so expect some long play sessions. Making it through the cock ring will summon some other ladies that want to get in on the fun. The sound effects when your ball rolls up or down a ramps resembles a cartoon boner. And the women are constantly mocking the size of your member. Not quite strong enough. That hole's already occupied. All of this plus a video mode where you chase around little sparkles? What more could you ask for? A-Force is another Women of Trouble table that's easy to keep it up. There's two crossover ramps on both sides that give it an extra dimension. A three-phase skill shot that always makes me feel guilty when I miss it. And you can recruit A-Force members by rotating the washing machine and completing the upper flipper shots, which act like a score and time modifier. There's opportunities for a three-way if you run into Titanium Man, or call a helicopter. And the main missions are activated by hitting the cross ramps to the towers. You can choose to play the five missions in any order, and you don't need to succeed to reach the wizard mode, where you blast balls with a gun. Games are long thanks to extra balls and liberal kickbacks, but it's actually really easy to nudge balls away from the outlanes. If you suck at dry humping, this is an excellent table to practice on. Painful. Monster Bash is a classic game where you need to light up and engage all six monsters before activating the wizard mode in the sinkhole. Manage to earn all six instruments and you'll get to play Monster Rock, or the true wizard mode. 
If you fail some of the instruments, don't worry, they'll stay lit after Monster Bash and you can try earning the ones you miss during the next cycle. There's other multiballs like Frankenstein's Monster and Mosh Pit, so get used to juggling or flailing around like an idiot, whichever suits your style. The shots are long and can send the ball falling back if you're not deliberate, but the difficulty is offset by the amount of extra balls you can pick up. There's even a feature that automatically flips your balls, if you remember to trust it. Creature from the Black Lagoon is a self-satirizing table with a flowy layout that's easy to discover. Score successful shots up the big ramp or move your car to begin game modes. There's even a video mode where you get to punch a sex offender in the face. Once you collect all the film letters, the final phase will start with you having to rescue the chick and follow the creature. And that's why we love these classic tables. They're easy to follow and entice you to make shots. And the new animations really bring things to life. The Williams Universal Monster Pack is good, but there's only two tables valued at $5 each, compared to other packs which average around $3.33 per game. I hope that future license holders go easy on negotiations, cause the dudes at Zen Studio are doing them a huge favor by preserving these killer titles. Tales of the Arabian Nights show how much can be done with just two flippers on a real table. The genie lamp in the middle is a great randomizer if you like reacting to shots, and you'll be coerced into rubbing it during the lightning bonus. Progression is natural, just talk to the genie every once in a while. Noobs can steal jewels from the bazaar, while experienced players can collect jewels without even thinking about the objectives. Battling the genie is a fair challenge, where it's about making the shots in a timely manner and not worrying about ball drains. Just make sure you hit the captive ball for extras. There's nails that come out of the table to save your ball from the outlanes. It's not just cool looking, it's good for quick action and consistent rhythm. The fireball is a nice effect that ties the table together. Just remember that summoning a genie is still illegal in some parts of the world. Circus Voltaire is a colorful carnival themed table that features a ringmaster that comes out of the sewer with coronavirus. You don't need to know what you're doing to complete all the missions, just go for the flashing lights. It's not until you get to the four phase wizard mode where the shots become more deliberate. It's when you have a limited amount of time that making your mark becomes harder, especially if you can't juggle. A bumper ejects from the table that makes a nice popping sound. Cradling is a little tricky because the balls like to go wild against the slings. There's a game on the backboard and even a video mode I didn't realize existed until after completing the wizard mode. The dot matrix animations can go on just a bit too long, which are the pinball equivalent to cutscenes. Maybe they could have used the double flipper hold to speed things up like they do in other tables. Everyone likes no good gophers, but I think it should be up there with the best tables ever made. I love how the table fights back. If it's not a whirlwind throwing you a curveball, then it's the gophers popping up. Then there's the bumpers which are cleverly positioned to give you just enough x-factor coming out of the left orbit. The ball rolls down the lane lowering a ramp that's taken a thin slice launching the ball into the upper level so that it catches the lip and slips back into the hole just like that. It's one of the most satisfying money shots you can bust out. There are multiple shots no matter which side of the table you're on, and there's a nice balance between complexity and mindlessness. It's the only pinball game I know where killing a bunch of country club members results in an extra ball and hitting animals in the face is encouraged. The last three tables are part of Williams Pinball Pack Volume 5, which is their strongest bundle yet. So if you haven't tried any of the real tables in Pinball FX3, I recommend starting here. That's all for now. I appreciate the feedback and shares from parts 1 and 2. So if you can blast part 3 around the internet, I'll be happy to cover more pinball in the future. There are several ways to track me down, so just take a look in the description or go to GameTestPlay.com to get a random take on video game music, retro, and indie titles.